I speak to you in the name of Christ, in the name of God, who created powerfully. And I speak to you in the name of Christ, who died violently. And I speak to you in the name of Christ, who rose unexpectedly. Amen. Please be seated. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Well done. But what if you don't? What if you can't? What if you just won't? And are simply unable to believe in the resurrection? And I'm not saying you in particular, but I'm saying it to people in general. Because I know, and you know, that there are many people, there are lots of people, there are perhaps a majority of people who don't actually believe in the physical resurrection of Christ. You may find yourself struggling with that idea. Over my lifetime, over all of our lifetimes, we've probably been to many funerals. We've probably observed many deaths. But has any of us, any of us, seen someone rise from the dead? Hands up. Particularly when I presided at the funerals of children, that's when you want it the most. The resurrection, believing in the resurrection of Jesus is hard. But we've got two examples this morning. Thomas, obviously, but then I also want to talk about Peter, who how they were transformed from being non-believers in the resurrection to being courageous believers in the resurrection. And there's three things that I notice about both of them. Is that first of all, there was an openness or a willingness to investigate, to inquire. Second, they both had a genuine encounter with the risen Christ. And third, after all, belief is the work of God. And the Holy Spirit empowered them and enabled them to transition from being non-believers to believers. Let's begin with Thomas. Every, I forgot, I can take this off while I'm up here. That way I can see my notes and my glasses don't fog up anymore. We know the story of uh, Thomas so well. The first day of the week, the disciples had gathered in that upper room they were fearful, they were afraid. There had been rumors that Jesus had indeed risen. And indeed, as they were discussing amongst themselves, as they were wondering, Jesus did, as Ollie just read to us from the Gospel of John, Jesus did appear to his disciples. And he blessed them, and he offered them peace, and in their joy, they were transitioned because they had an encounter with Christ and became believers. But Thomas was not there. Later on, Thomas was there, but Christ had already gone. And they said to Thomas, we have met the Lord. We have seen the risen Lord. And Thomas basically says, nonsense. <laughs> unless, unless I put my finger in the holes of his hand and my hand in his wounded side, I'll not believe. And I get that. As I get older, I think, I find things harder and harder to believe. We all understand Thomas. We want proof. A few days later, 
Indeed, Thomas is now with his disciple pals. And Jesus does appear. And I like to think that Jesus just kind of walked straight up to Thomas and said, here I am. Now, Thomas, put your finger in my nail prints. Put your hand in my side and believe. And all Thomas could do was say, my Lord and my God, I believe. For Thomas, it's very much a seeing is believing situation. Thomas had transitioned from being a non-believer and a cynic and a doubter by an encounter with the risen Christ into being a believer, one who proclaimed the resurrection. How do we transition from disbelief to belief? How do we transition from being doubtful about the resurrection to being positive and proclaimers of the resurrection? I'm going to turn from Thomas now to look at that other famous, most famous disciple, Peter. Simon Peter, the rock. Simon Peter, the blunderer. Simon Peter, who perhaps usually said the wrong thing at the wrong time. Simon Peter, who had great, great intention for himself, but was not able to follow through, as it turned out. You see, Simon Peter was also transformed by the resurrection. Hear me out. This past Holy Week, we have heard the various stories of Jesus' last days on earth. And we know that at the Last Supper, Peter was there. He didn't understand what Jesus was doing when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. And then when Jesus said, one of you here will betray me, Peter said, no, I would never. I will follow you to the end, right? Do you remember him saying that? And Jesus said, of course, well, Peter, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me how many times? Three times. Peter blustered. But we know how it goes. The garden, again, Peter was full of bravado. The soldiers came up, and Peter reacted and drew out his sword and cut off someone's ear, proclaiming, I will follow, I will follow. But then all of the disciples, including Peter, as Jesus was taken away, deserted. Now, it turns out then that Peter followed at a distance, didn't he? He didn't go into the high priest Caiaphas' house. He stayed in the courtyard. Do you remember what happened there? A servant girl. A servant girl said, Oh, you were, you are one of his disciples, are you not? And Peter's reaction, we know it, no, I was not. I do not know the man. And he repeated that rebuttal, he repeated that rebuttal. It was three times that he denied knowing, even knowing who Jesus was. It's a sheer act of cowardice and disloyalty on his part. And the rooster crowed twice. And the scriptures record that he wept bitterly. And then things change. On Easter day, Peter was with the other disciples. And Luke records in the Gospel of Luke that Mary and other women went to the garden tomb to prepare the body 
only to discover in a meeting with angels that the body was not there, Jesus was not there, and what we proclaimed and celebrated last week and we continue to celebrate is that he is risen. Alleluia, they said, he is risen. And Mary rushed back to where the other disciples were, particularly Peter and John, having had an encounter saying, I, I have seen the Lord. The disciples mocked her. They said, what you're telling us is simply an idle tale. It's nonsense, really. But nonetheless, and here's the thing. Here's the first thing that helped Peter transition from disbelief to belief. Nonetheless, Peter went to the tomb. You see, he was willing. He was open. He was hopeful. He was not a believer yet, but he was willing to go. And as they say, he showed up, right? He just showed up. He went to the tomb. It was indeed empty. And he was bewildered. But Peter's transition from disloyalty and disbelief and cowardice is beginning to take place here. He was willing to at least show up, to at least investigate. Also in Luke's Gospel, the story that is often read on this first Sunday after Easter is the story of the walk to Emmaus, where two disciples walk from Jerusalem to a village called Emmaus. It's a long walk, and a stranger joins them. Perhaps you recall the story. And as they were walking along, they're talking about Jesus' life and Jesus' death in particular. And they were bewildered by it. And this stranger, who as it turns out was Jesus, this stranger begins to explain everything to them. And as they get to where they're supposed to, the village, the two, two wanderers invite Jesus to stay with them, still not knowing who he is. And as he breaks bread, they realize it's him. And Jesus disappears. And those two disciples pick up right away and they run back to where the disciples are to say, we have seen the Lord now. There are encounters with Jesus. First of all, there's a willingness to investigate Jesus. Jesus claims of resurrection. A willingness. Second, there's an encounter. The disciples, Mary, had had an encounter with Jesus. The encounter that Jesus had with Peter is nowhere recorded in the New Testament, except that St. Paul, when he writes to the letters, writes his first letter to the Corinthians, said that Jesus appeared to Peter and then to all the disciples. So what's happened here is that there's been a willingness of Peter to shift, there's been an encounter, and now what? And now there is complete transformation. But how did Peter get to that encounter? How did Thomas get to that encounter? And it is, as I say, the fact that they just showed up, they were willing. When I was 14, I had my own encounter with the resurrected Christ. And it's because of that encounter of the resurrected Christ, when I was just 14, that I'm here still 46 years later still believing in the resurrection. My encounter, my testimony, I don't have time to go into all the detail. My testimony involved going to a Christian Bible camp. It was an all ages camp and I was part of the youth group. We'd had a wonderful week of 
preaching and teaching and singing and activities. And at the end of the week, we participated in what we called then, forgive me, it was the 70s, a love feast, another word for communion. You know what I'm talking about, eh? And we darkened the room and we set up bread and grape juice, as it turns out. We set up bread and grape juice on a central table. And members of the youth group would two by two just go up and exchange bread and wine with each other, praying for each other. And for me as a 14 year old, there was something so tremendously powerful in that room, that the room absolutely simmered with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I knew at that moment in those relationships in that room over the bread and wine that Christ indeed was risen. It's not just a story. It's not just an idle tale. And that realization and that encounter that I had is the reason I am standing here still today proclaiming it. Back to Peter. We see that he was willing to show up. We have understood through the writing of St. Paul that he did indeed have his own direct encounter. But he was not yet transformed. He was still cowering in an upper room. And on the day of Pentecost, a gathering had come together to pray as Jesus had commanded, to pray. And the power of the Holy Spirit just came down upon them. And here we see now the transformed Peter. He goes out into the street and starts proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is indeed risen. Later, as we heard from the story in the Acts of the Apostles that Wendy read for us, later Peter is commanded by the authorities to stop preaching about the resurrection. But he doesn't stop. In fact, now he is so bold, and this is the same guy who cowered from a maid in the courtyard. I'll read his words. He is now so bold that he can say these words. We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. He is so bold that he is stating to his audience what they have done and that they must repent and turn from it. We see Peter was transformed. We see also in the scripture that Thomas was transformed. And I'm testifying that I've been transformed. What does it take to be transformed? Well, you've showed up. You're here. A willingness. A willingness to meet the risen Christ. A willingness, an openness perhaps. Perhaps just simply the possibility. Or, or just the wanting to want to believe. Willingness. And second, if you're willing, you will indeed have an encounter with the living Christ. Trust me. <laughs>
I promise. And after that encounter, you will have a bold, a bolder, boldest faith. And you will be proud to speak his name, to say along with Mary and others, I have seen the Lord, and to believe with comfort and assurity in the resurrection. Amen.